All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Spotlight. Our guest today is Dr. David Cox. He is the director of the Scheme Library and OSL here at New Mexico Tech. And this session today will be recorded and put up on our OSL YouTube channel. Uh, so for those of you who are not watching it live, it will be located on the OSL YouTube channel. So I, I just wanted to start by welcoming you, Dr. Cox. We're glad to have you as a guest. And uh, just please tell us a little bit about you and, and your career background, anything you think people might want to know about you. Well, I'm not exactly sure people will be interested in anything, but um, some of the strange parts of my background are I'm from the West Coast in the sense of literally the coast. I grew up in a place called Bellingham, Washington, which is only uh, about 16 odd miles south of the Canadian border. And uh, so uh, being on the coast there, I, I grew up not dry like we are down here in New Mexico, but definitely wet, okay? And uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, it was a place where you had uh, skiing down, a, you know, a uh, almost 11,000 foot mountain within an hour. You had uh, all the wonder of uh, the Puget Sound Basin, which meant that you had uh, right on the coast, a, a very protected part of the inner waterways. And so you got to have a saltwater lake is what you got and lots of things that you could work with and, and actually a very temperate climate. So um, I didn't grow used to extremes pretty much until after I got out of college and went to the Midwest and got used to what winter really was. And uh, then also coming to places like New Mexico, where of course our sun is delightful, but it is also relentless. And so uh, it's a whole different world here. And uh, I'm glad to be part of that. I, um, I went to school at a few different places, Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma uh, Washington, and uh, then uh, Wartburg Theological Seminary back in Dubuque, Iowa, where I got a couple of degrees, um, and uh, the University of St. Andrews, I was a fellow there, and that was a lot of fun, uh, and got my PhD there, and then uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which I will say specifically for Sarah's benefit, the number one library school in the country. Um, for I don't know how many years running. But that's well, you know, we all just can't. We all can't, you know. What are you, what are you saying, sir? <laughs> just being a snot. Oh, okay. Sarah went to a great school too. Uh, San, San Jose is a great school. My son went to San Jose, so I really, I really just have this penchant of poking people with a fork when I talk. I will that. say for David's benefit that Urbana was my top choice, but. Yeah. The checkbook gods were not with me that year. Oh, it was a lot of money, and <laughs> it was it was pretty elite group. Um, I'm amazed they let me in the door. So, uh, it, but it was a great education. So, but um, in my lifetime, I've been a, a, a Lutheran pastor. Uh, still am, even though I'm on the retired roster, and I'm actually preaching up in a place called Las Lunas uh, right now uh, to help a congregation out. Uh, I uh, have been a part of the American Schools of Oriental Research, which means I was an archaeologist, and uh, I was an archaeologist in uh, Israel, uh, and also in some of uh, the occupied territories when I was working uh, for that group back in the 70s. Uh, I, uh, I guess I've been a little bit of everything and had a lot of fun doing it. Is that good enough, Katie? That's wonderful. Yeah. So, okay. so you've had a, a really long and windy journey, a really interesting journey to get here. Mm -hmm. So what was it that, that actually brought you to New Mexico Tech? Well, I, I will admit it was the opportunity to be a library director. I'd worked in a lot of different libraries, uh, either as a volunteer or as a student or, or in doctoral work, helping somebody else out. And a lot, a lot, of, a lot of our uh, research scientists here uh, know their way around the library uh, because they've had to live in them for years. Uh, but uh, finally getting to be able to be a library director was an old dream of mine. And, and I liked the idea of being not only a library director, but also the director of the OSL in that um, really it's a, a one-stop shop when we're not in COVID-19. 
And for students who are listening to this, uh, we are hoping to have some on-site services with the tutorials uh, with the o Office for Student Learning. And, um, and we're looking forward to that in the fall of 2021. We're still going to probably have, as as far as I think Katie and Sophie and I have talked, uh, also the virtual online uh, tutorial ability for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, we also had the peer mentors, which is a great group to be a part of, and which uh, you're probably finding this video either on our YouTube uh, channel listing or on the Discord server for peer mentoring because. Uh, we try to we try to make it so that it's a great clearing clearinghouse of information uh, for you as new students. So hopefully you you will see this, uh, and maybe you're even on the Discord for peer mentors. So um, I liked all of that. I, I, uh, one of the things I liked about in my time in the church and in other academic centers, uh, because I've taught at different places at different times. Uh, uh, at Seattle U, at, a, at the Northwest Theological Union, or uh, at uh, Waldorf College in Iowa, or even here at New Mexico Tech, I taught ethics, uh, it was that I enjoyed the learning experience uh, much more uh, than just by myself being a researcher, but by helping students turn on the lights and uh, understand that they could really become uh, experts in certain fields. So um, all of that was why I wanted to come to New Mexico Tech. It's a STEM school, as anybody listening to this uh, vid will, will understand. And so I had to learn other bits and pieces to, to be able to function here. And, and I liked the challenge of all that. I guess um, I will want challenges all my life, uh, no matter if I maybe get in my 80s and somehow I am still looking for a challenge, you should expect. Yeah, you definitely don't back from, down from a challenge. What I've learned from your previous careers, especially as a as a pastor, going to different churches and helping them out, and um, as an archaeologist too. So, what from those from being a pastor, from being an archaeologist, what have you learned and what have you brought uh, to your career here at Ski and Library and OSL? I, I think I've I've brought both a sense that uh, uh, there isn't anybody. Uh, as expert as many of our, our researchers are here. There isn't anybody who hasn't got the ability to learn more or to learn something that they have never learned. So, so uh, I, I learned that in the church, uh, dealing with many different peoples and situations. I had worked at a bishop's office. I worked trying to fix places that were having problems as well as uh, trying to help people learn how to talk to each other, okay? and to think together as a community. The um, archaeology, I think, I think what I bring from that is just a passion to discover. Uh, and, uh, and really, university is all about that. In coming here at Tech, you're going to learn how to discover things. You're going to learn how to research. Uh, and you may be researching even as a freshman because that happens here. And you're going to learn what it is to stretch yourself and discover new things, uh, things that are just waiting for you. So uh, all of that comes into my my time, I think, here, Katie. Um, and, and hopefully I get to share that with people and I try to encourage you guys who are here as staff or uh, other other students to, to, to be willing to, to do this. So uh, that's how you become a, a help to your society and to the world, so. That's awesome. And I understand you have a, a relic with you. Uh, I have a, a relic, did you say? Relic or, you know, some, some treasures in I your, have in your office. I relic so. queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I understand. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any of the saints relics, but uh, there's some things <laughs> here that might remind you. Of that. Um, this is a bronze 2B uh, pot that I'm going to show you here. This is a complete pot, uh, it's never been broken, okay? And and I'm holding it here, and I'd let any of you hold it if you come by and visit me. Uh, it, this is uh, a good 4,000 years old. It was found in the, the Jebus sites uh, of what they would call the beginnings of Jerusalem. And uh, as it being, uh, you know, middle bronze 
uh, B, uh, to B, uh, it, it is as old as what people would say Abraham, 4,000 year pot and it's an oil flask. And you can take a look at it, uh, you know, you can see it looks like something very nice. And uh, really the pottery in this period was, was made in such a way as to resemble metal items. Okay, and so that's why this looks kind of the way it does. It also, however, was built for people who didn't have a whole lot of money and they lived in like mud types of houses, okay? And in the kitchen, they would have a shelf, a mud-ish shelf, let us say, usually made out of mud bricks, but it had a little pliability. And so this is why it's pointed at the end. You go like this and you get to have a holder on the shelf, okay? And, and what I like about this pot the most uh, is that if you put your fingers on it, you can feel the wheel. Not only can you feel the wheel, you can feel the fingers of somebody 4,000 years old working with this, making it so that in the technology of their day, this was really something, okay? And uh, if you were to be able to, you know, stick a, something into this pot, this way and go down and have like a little bit of a what I would call a claw or a grasp or you could scrape out inside there and bring out enough of a residue that you could do research on it in chemistry and find out uh, what oil what it contained. It of course contained olive oil but you could perhaps find things of the type of oils from around Jerusalem at the time. Um, you can also have a sense that you see there's kind of a line moving around on this that's kind of the end of what this is here. These are different types of, um, oh, uh, what I would call glazing, okay? Pots in this period were very, very decorated. Um, and, and it showed a sign uh, in a time of a very high economy that was going on. In fact, uh, there are pieces from this time that you could have gotten from Crete you could have gotten from Egypt, even from um, up uh, north, uh, uh, places where, you know, at the, uh, the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, places all the way across to the bottom of what we would know as present day Iraq and Iran right there in the, where the water comes in for, from both the Euphrates and the Tigris into uh, the, the Persian Gulf, which had a lot of civilization at the time. So. Uh, this one, however, as best as we can tell, is something that is probably from Palestine, not just because it shows up there, but because of the nature of how it's built. Now, one of the ways we know that it's a to be is what you do is you learn how to read pottery. This part up here, you have a spout a handle, okay? Spouts and handles, you can see this very definite, okay? In fact, as we were identifying this pot coming up out of the ground in Jerusalem, uh, you could see that uh, this period here identified it as when I say uh, Middle Bronze to be, okay, because of its very clear looking uh, resemblance to what would have been a metal prototype. It also identified from down here. And if you take a look at this, you might see a little bit of uh, oh, glazing on it, a little bit of red glazing. Okay, I'm turning it around. You might see it. This was probably a very nice decorated red pot uh, with some other swirls on it. And uh, it's kind of fun. Um, I note that when I give these to kids to look at, they love them, they're playing with them. Their parents, when I used to do this, they would just be petrified, okay? Because they're afraid they're gonna drop it. But the kids the kids realized what it was that you could do this to it. And, you know, and, and I'm doing it here at my desk and everybody else might be taking a breath, but archeology span is a lot of fun. So this is my oldest piece. Uh, it is a complete piece. And it's actually dated to the dig of Dame Catherine Kenyon when she uh, worked on uh, the bottom of Jerusalem. And she's a great uh, British archeologist and it would have been toward the 50s, uh, 1950s in Israel. So there you go, okay? I got one of these. That's incredible. Okay, so you can come up and play with it, Katie, anytime you want it. Now, right. I've got uh, some other fun things. And these are things I used to use to try to teach people about uh, technology and about uh, how you mark a culture. How do you uh, 
mark your living environment? How do people crazy as me years later do, you know, come in and do things? Um, one of the things I have here, and I'm going to try to get them on the camera so you see them, is uh, coins have been around for a while as money, as you might know. Okay. And so I'm going to show these to you. Okay. These are what you call Roman, um, uh, they would call them denarii. Okay. And if you take a look at the back of it here, what I like is that that is uh, Mana, uh, Mana Dei, uh, the goddess of Rome, and a very kind of cool thing. On the front, you, oh, on this one, you've got, uh, oh, uh, it looks to me like the emperor. And if I look at it closely enough, this one is, I believe, uh, Hadrianus. Uh, Hadrianus being Hadrian, uh, who built Hadrian's Wall up in, between England and Scotland, okay? So that's Hadrianus. Um, this one here uh, is a different picture of, uh, of, of Bona Dei, okay? But you might be able to see it, really, if I bring it up close enough, okay? Um, uh, the, the coins uh, really tell a great deal about the culture. Uh, because uh, deities are on them, as well as emperors who, by the time these coins were struck, were considered deities on Earth. Um, and so when you're looking at them, um, and uh, I'm just adding my own saliva here because it's one of the nice cleaners that you can have. Uh, you, can, you can see different types of uh, things on them, uh, different types of uh, emphases. Uh, I like one here. Is see if I can pull it up for us. This one here is uh, Nerva, which was an emperor. This is very rare. This is an emperor that only lasted less than a year. Okay, and in uh, the 90-ish area era. But on the back, it's kind of fun. You see somebody uh, that is worshiping. Okay, and so they're dancing. Okay, it's kind of fun. And I've got this one here, which is uh, is really been beat up over the course of time. But as, as I look at it, it is definitely one I like because uh, you've got a, a person on a horse. It's equestrian. Okay, there's a knight on a horse on this one. Um, and and as as metal was struck, it was usually struck in different governing areas. Cicerstes could be struck by governors of a province, things like that. Uh, they just had to have the right seals for the emperor's uh, requirements on the front. This one last thing I have is uh, got the mark of Pontius Pilate on it. It's got a P that you probably can't see even as I hold it up, but it's got a P. And, and it has a mark of Pilate on it. And this is what you call a widow's mite. This is a penny, basically. And this is poor people's money, right? I mean, to, if you were working uh, a full day's job, this would be a day's wages, okay? And it's pure silver, of course, uh, but it's it's a day's wages. That's what you got for a day's wages back. All right? This is made out of copper. And so uh, it dates from Pontius Pilate, and for me, uh, it, within church work, this means it's during the prefector of Pilate during the time Jesus lived. That's why this is an important one. Okay, um, just some coins. Uh, you know, coins are pretty available. You, you know, you you kick them up on the ground. And you think that maybe they're a piece of rock. You know, so they're usually dirty. And the way you clean them up, is you get lemon juice and you put them between your fingers and your thumb and you just rub them. Okay, that's a that's all archaeologists usually do. They rub them unless you're in a in a really expensive museum area like a British Museum or the Louvre or, or uh, the, the museums in say like Jerusalem or Greece or Pergamon uh, uh, Museum, uh, they may have other things. That you have. Here is something I just want to show you. This is a wonderful little thing called uh, Roman glass. Roman glass. You see that beautiful glass there? You know, see there's some, oh, you know, some remarkable different minerals that are in the glass that was made at the time. Um, uh, this one has a little hole in the back, and it's because I had it in my, my office desk years ago, and somebody who was coming in and cleaning it hit it and it smashed it, so I had to put it back together. One of the things I learned how to do as an archaeologist, one of my favorite jobs, 
was reconstructing things from the ground and putting them into solid pieces. Okay, so that was that was one of my specific jobs. But, uh, uh, this is what they call a tear vase. Now, if you were to watch, uh, what was it? Oh, Kovatis, uh, uh, the person playing Nero, which was uh, Peter Ustinov. I think he got an Oscar for this. Uh, but uh, he was playing the Emperor Nero. And when he was sad about something, he would cry a tear for them. And he put up a piece of glass like this to his eyes. You see, what this is, is the, the memory vase of some Roman from Jerusalem in the first century AD, or CE, if, if you want that. So, so what you got here, this holds the memories of someone from 2,000 years ago. Imagine that. The stuff at the bottom of this, okay, will have the residue of the tears of a person as they were remembering something. So I like I like this kind of cool because this is a very personal item, okay, and then and and being Roman glass, you can take a look at it. it's very nice. Uh, but Roman glass at the time, you're not talking about like glass behind me in my window. You're talking about glass that still is being produced in its earliest stages, and so uh, and it was dependent upon the mineral uh, in the quartz and things like that that you had in it. Do I have anything else? I think I have one other thing. And then I'll get off archaeology. That way you can all be happy. Let's see. Oh, yeah. This here is a poor person's lamp. Okay. That's a lamp. It's a poor person's lamp. Okay. It's made out of really junky materials, uh, but it's hard. It was baked hard. And what you would do is you would have oil go into this, right? And you would put a, a wick out here. It would burn, much like much like our oil candles do nowadays, or like regular candles. This is where the wick would come out, and this is where the oil would go in, and and people would wander around like this in their house, you know, basically to be able to see light, you know, and see things, or maybe uh, if they were lucky enough, uh, they might have family presence, so they wanted to be in their house at night, and so it gave just a little light, but just enough so people could see things. It's it's a peasant's. Uh, uh, first century Palestine, Israel, uh, you can, if you looked at it really hard, you could see some Hebrew here, okay? And it, it's very much in the old script, uh, It, but it does remind us of uh, things that, um, well, people used to use. See that it, It's kind of yucky on the end here, you know, it's a little soot. Uh, inside, it, it probably still has some old uh, oil remnant, uh, but... When people live all the time, they make a technology, they make a engineering list. And uh, when you come to tech, if you're in the engineering side, of course you're gonna be dealing with engineering and technology. Uh, that's why we call it tech. And uh, this just happens to be stuff from 2000 years ago to 4,000 years ago. And I'm just an old guy who has old stuff and I'll let you look at it if you ever wanna come by. So, there's that. That's awesome. A, you got a small museum. Yeah. Oh, my kids probably won't know what to do with this when I croak. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's fun. Um, I'd be happy to bring some lemon juice and rub some more off of these old coins. But uh, you can come up here and I'll teach you how to be an amateur archaeologist for the, for the present day. But, uh, right. Yeah, where you can catch a tear. That too is kind of interesting, isn't it? The whole concept of excretions uh, being able to contain memory. And, and um, it's kind of funny for tears that you find out in the 20th century that the, um, the chemical nature of a tear for sadness is different from the chemical nature of a tear for, for stress or a chemical nature of a tear that it comes when there's pain. It's a very interesting thing mm. that, that's so. Uh, ask your chemi chemical, you know, professors or your biology people. They'll know about that stuff. So, all uh -huh. sorts. Of, so, 
Um, so, so going well, back get, get to me somewhere uh, else because I can stay yeah. in this place for. Well, th this was wonderful. So thank you okay. for sharing that with everybody. Um, but going back to Skeen Library, I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, we had a lot of programs here that that directly impact students. And I'm just wondering, um, which of those things have you missed about, you know, all the in-person activities that we would do? I've, I've missed being able to sit next to a student, looking through a record uh, that they're trying to deal with, whether it be digital or physical, and try to identify the things that they need to, to perhaps pay attention to if they're going to use them as, um, you know, something as a citation, uh, how, how, they, how they draw out knowledge, of not only from the item, either written or whatever that they're using, but how they cite it. Uh, Sarah could tell you all of the different things from the ACRL uh, that, we, that we go back to basically, like uh, authority is, uh, is created, okay? And it is uh, uh, something that uh, as we look at things, we study them and curate them. And, and, and so we create them and cite them, okay? Authority in a, in a document. Okay, or authority in, in when you're starting to do your research. Uh, and it works across the line for whether you're dealing with uh, physics, nuclear science, uh, biology, uh, chemistry, uh, electrical engineering, um, uh, tech communication. Uh, all of that, thank you, Sarah, for the LibGuides. Uh, she's just put something in the chat you should see. It's about our LibGuides. So uh, it's in the fac faculty section. Uh, how we how we try to work with faculty and students to learn how to really become experts in their field by uh, curating their their materials and creating authority through citation and uh, being able to make certain that what they do is quality. Um, uh, information is power. Information is something that uh, that uh, really is uh, in all of our uh, academic departments. Uh, something that they interact with the world with, uh, you know, with all the journals and everything that we see either digitally or in paper or in other uh, reports that come from conferences. You, you build your reputation on the ability to research, do it well, do it with authority that you have created and then to express it with other uh, colleagues. Uh, this this is how we do things in a scientific university, and this is how we do things at an academic library. Sarah is very good at that. Uh, I I love doing it. I hope I hope that the students are surviving me after they're done with me. But uh, uh, you know, with tutoring, it it also comes to play. Sometimes when we're tutoring something, uh, and uh, you could speak to this, Katie, uh, the idea of getting them not only to understand a concept. But then to use that concept if they have sources to be able to prove their point. So yes, I mean, and that's that's one of the skills that they that they do as tutors is they refer students back to the original source of the information. So whether it be their textbooks, their notes, or anything that their professors have said, it, they also teach a little bit about research and then how to apply that knowledge mm -hmm. to new problems. See, so, so I I picked up when I got my PhD a research PhD. Okay, which puts me in a little strange category, but it was linguistics, you know, philology, and it was ancient documents and ancient uh, world conversations. And so it, um, Sarah's probably picked up a fair, a fair bit of that with uh, medieval Latin when she did her master's uh, degree, uh, it, it, even though that she did a lot of things with uh, uh, what I would call mapping and, uh, and uh, tracking different pilgrims to pilgrimage sites in uh, England. And forgive me, Sarah, I don't remember the exact saint. I, I, I'm sorry. That's but, okay, uh, William of Norwich. And there you go, William of Norwich. Um, <laughs> but uh, Norwich had a lot of saints to be quite, uh, quite honest. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, the one that I remember from Norwich more is Julian of Julian. Norwich. Yeah. But uh, the the fact is, is that you have to, when your research work, whether it be in humanities or history or languages or whatever, or science, whether it be in chemistry or or, or physics, I come back to or biology, um, uh, or if it be in engineering sciences, research really has a, 
a, uh, a provenance, let's say, of how you do it. And provenance meaning that there, somebody has taught you how to do research and you teach research and beyond you, you literally will have certain people who will claim you in their, their academic tree uh, for research. One of the things I think physicists love to get through is to get back to Newton in their provenance, uh, that they could trace all these scholars going back to Newton, for example, or Galileo. Uh, for other things, you know, I mean, for, you know, it, these are, it may sound like, oh, that's silly, but these are the things you build yourself on, okay? I mean, it, it, my provenance in, in languages was very important to, to show because it showed that I uh, wasn't a, a spot, you know, flash in the pan, uh, but I had learned through the best. And uh, so uh, when you come here, you're going to have some of the best scholars in the world at teaching you things. But you're also picking up what they have learned on what they would call the shoulders of others. That becomes your providence too. Uh, and, uh, and you learn how to research from people who have been researching and have been taught by researchers before them for hundreds of years. Uh, and, and, and that may just seem like, oh, that's Dr. Cox is just acting silly again. You know, uh, on the other hand, Got to be proud of that. Um, you people who research have been brought up on the shoulders of others, and 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 for them, those who learn from them are their uh, academic pedigree in some ways. And uh, and so when you come here, in some ways, if you learn from Sarah, she's part of your part of your providence. She's a part of who who is a part of you. If you learn from Katie or from Sophie, let's say in the OSL or or one of those tutors, they become a little bit like your provenance. Um, education is not uh, an individual uh, sport in some ways. I mean, everybody has to make their own notes. They have to read their own material. They have to, uh, for me, I remember sneezing in the basements of libraries because all the crap I had to dig up and items <laughs> had dust and junk all over it okay and uh you were yeah you would warn curators you know this is starting to get this type of a mold you might want to take care of this uh you know i mean sounds crazy but w you know, as a researcher you're you're interactive with all these different groups the um the fact of the matter is um you are becoming a scholar you are becoming a scholar and i'm going to say that a third time so you get it you come here you're going to become a scholar you may be a scholar in mechanical engineering, and so you think, oh, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm an engineer. Well, you are. You're also becoming an expert in some things. And, and that, is, that is not to be sniffed at. And the library finds uh, some pride, or I do as a librarian, in being part of that conversation. And I'm sure Katie and Sophie and Sarah, all as instructor types and tutors and, and research helpers, they find pride in that too. We like helping students. We want to help you be able to do things that make us go when we are in our, our silver years, which start to happen here. Uh, we see something you publish and we say, I was a part of that. It, this is a community effort and scholarship is a community sport. And um, academics, uh, tech is going to give you a degree that they're going to be proud of you as you go out and do well. And hopefully you'll be proud of tech because this was the place that formed you. So, sorry, Katie. I get yeah, so wax eloquent and somebody should tell me to be quiet. Go ahead. Give me a question. Well, this, this dovetails perfectly with, with what I was going to ask. It's speaking on, on research and how that's so important. Um, we've got the Student Research Symposium coming up yeah. very soon, April 14th through 16th. So. Uh, what can you tell people about the Student Research Symposium? Well, this year is the 10th year. That's the first thing I'd want to tell you. We've been doing it for 10 years coming to this year. And, and the last two versions of it, the one that's coming this spring in April 14th through 17th, as well as the one last year, were the first times this event, Student Research Symposium, or SRS it's often called, uh, went totally virtual. Usually what we have had is in-person types of things where, uh, like if you were presenting what they would call a research poster, which you're gonna get very used to because this is a staple 
of information transfer uh, for numerous uh, academic communities, um, you would you would uh, be there and uh, you would have a, a poster. Let's say oh, let's say forty five inches by thirty. Six inches or something, okay, rectangle. And, uh, and in this rectangle, you would be trying to describe some research that you were doing. You would describe your processes. You would describe some preliminary results. You would you would also uh, see uh, where you thought this was going and all of the reference materials that you could could share with people on this topic, okay. And if you have co-collaborators, it's up on top. It really teaches you as a poster how you then show your work okay uh along with that uh there's a couple oral sections of this uh, uh srs that are a little better uh is suited to people who really know how to think on their feet okay one of them is called the oral presentations and i get to uh, help uh, with that this year uh, again, and I'm real thrilled with that. Usually back in, in uh, pre-COVID days, we have a big banquet and we'd serve, uh, of all things, turkey, which, you know, of course, you could then get loaded up on uh, on that substance that will make you fall asleep, which is, it's for me, I just always found that to be terrifically uh uh, funny that we would feed you with something that had tryptophan in it so that you could then have to try to be awake for six oral presentations, all right? Uh, never mind me, I'm just weird, okay? Uh, but the, the the thing is, is that each person will go from eight to nine minutes with multiple slides, and you'll learn that that's what you call your different sections in a PowerPoint presentation. You would have different slides on your research, which you would then use in this eight to nine minute period to try to explain clearly live on your feet with uh, at least 60 people in the room, okay, how uh, this works. And then you would have to answer questions from the audience cold, okay? Trust me. You get into a boardroom someday in your business or in your professional life, you're going to be doing exactly that. So this this is a, you know, not just the poster type of training, but this is the way you learn how to do presentations for others in, in your profession. Also, there is a there is a group called the three minute speech competition, and this has been around for a number of years. And it was developed by a person who in Australia, of all places, uh, uh, where they were trying to save water, had a three minute timer in their, their shower. And so they turned the timer over as the water went on and they'd wash up and get cleaned up before the timer went out. Well, the idea then that was spawned from this uh, uh, crazy activity was uh, then if I were to have to say something to someone in three minutes, how could I do it in such a way that my research which is very technical, could be explained to somebody in a general educated audience and do so uh, with limited uh, types of props, okay? So what you get is one slide in that, three minutes, and you must finish your material within three minutes, and you have to do it in such a way as to show the judges that you really know what you're talking about, and the judges are going to be just generally educated people, people with at least a bachelor's degree, sometimes masters, sometimes PhDs. We we get different groups together every year. And um, Sarah, I think, did one of those one year, didn't you, Sarah? Um, and, um, and, and so these people were, and Sarah's got a couple of masters, okay? So these people would uh, come and they present and they're live and we're making uh, evaluations of them. And in fact, the orals get evaluations, the three minute speeches get evaluations, and the posters get evaluations. So you can learn how to present and get reviewed and learn how to do it better. Uh, one of the people I think is uh, just a poster child for this, and she'd kill me for calling her that. Uh, uh, Ishani is her first name. Uh, she's at a university uh, in uh, uh, San Diego right now and uh, on a doctoral, postdoctoral thing. And I got to see her over the course of time improve, improve, improve until she wiped everybody out at these presentations and got first places. Uh, and uh, Shani from uh, Sri Lanka uh, perfected styles that could work not only in Sri Lanka, but here, you know, in the United States, things like, you see, it, it was really good because um, you learn how to, to talk to diverse audiences. 
This year and last year, we added a new feature. And if you come here, uh, you'll like this. This is called Departmental Showcase or Departmental Project. And this is where different departments will bring in alumni from their, their profession or their, their academic uh, field and uh, people from uh, tech already. Also people who are interested in tech. So you might get people listening from different job sites. And you'll also get people sometimes listening from different graduate schools. And what happens is, is they're gonna listen to you present your project or your concept uh, in such a way that you'll be with your department faculty and it will be recorded just like all these other ones get recorded. And uh, what happens is, is that you get a step up. You get a step up in how to deal with any of those different associations, alumni, uh, professional, uh, business, uh, laboratories, or, or basically academic departments that want to look for graduate students. And uh, tech, by the way, has got the highest, I just want to say this, the highest uh, rating for uh, people coming through our bachelor programs who go into uh, PhD programs in the United States. Uh, okay, uh, sorry about that. I just had to say that. Uh, we, we're, we're number one there, okay? So that's pretty good. Uh, you come here, you're going to learn what you need to learn. And you're going to be ready for higher edge programs. And so all of these with SRS happens over three day period for the academic presentations. And now this year, we've got this funny little golf tournament uh, where we're all going to go out and make divots in the golf course. That means you're going to excise grass okay and uh you, because you're going to leave a mark on the girl never mind it, it, i'm going to do that maybe you would do that. and uh the the idea is is that there's plenty of ways to learn and this is a community that will help you learn and succeed and i would say excel so sorry katie go ahead ask yeah, me yeah i you, yep. you got to admit Katie, Katie is still being kind to me. She hasn't learned how to tell me, David, you know, so go ahead. Well, you're saying a lot of good stuff, so there's no need to cut you off. Okay. So, um, yeah, and, and like you were saying, we do offer a lot of help too. So for those who participate, um, it, it's extremely beneficial, I'd say, for first year students, for freshmen, because it's it's an, your entry into, into research and they're, they're plenty of people to help you along the way. You have your advisor, you have all the, the workshops that we do, so. Yeah, one of the things you've put up this year, which is really great, Katie, is the different vids of people who have, have been really benefited by being in the SRS um, and, and how that changed their perspective, how they got into research and research changed their perspective. Uh, if you were to talk to one of our professors, uh, Mustafa Hassanalian, uh, Dr. Hassanelian does uh, drone work, okay? And he's in one of these YouTube things, so you might want to go back and look for that. Uh, but uh, he, he states that if you get into research with drones, uh, the people in his programs, their grade point goes up. They get excited. They, they realize they're contributing. And you see, I think that's what tech does best. We, we try to yeah, get yeah. You into research. It, it makes the connections too between yep. between what you learn in class and then the practical things that you're doing with your projects. So, oh. okay, Katie, give me another question or whatever you need to do. Well, I have a couple more questions, but I just wanted to open it up and see if sure. anyone else had any questions. All right, everybody, give Katie a chance to have a drink of water. All right. <laughs> what are you reading at the moment, David? Well, I read a lot of weird stuff. That's why I asked. Okay, and I also read a lot of <laughs> common stuff, okay? Uh, this is one of the things I'm reading right now. Uh, everybody's gonna laugh. I don't know if it'll come up right. It, it should, it, it, what it means is successful aging is written by a neuroscientist and uh, it uh, explores the power and potential of our lives. And uh, this guy is really quite good. I just finished it. It's a great book. Uh, guy's name is Daniel J. Levetin. Uh, he's a doctor. Uh, he's written things like Your Brain on Music, as well as The Organized Mind. And this one is basically trying to do developmental neuroscience. Okay. And, and how does this make it so that uh, 
It deals with issues like uh, dementia, it deals with issues like Alzheimer's. And it also deals with ways to keep uh, your, your mind active, uh, your body active. How can, uh, how can you uh, deal with things as, as, uh, as crazy maybe as, as, as dealing with um, uh, the genealogy and uh, DNA loops and uh, the ends uh, of, of your uh, different uh, chromosomes that help uh, things regenerate, okay, uh, in your body. And so uh, when I started reading this, I realized that my daughter-in-law, now this is a shameless plug, okay, everybody has a right to one shameless plug, okay, this is for my daughter-in-law, her name is Michelle, Michelle uh, Sarah Cox, she has a place up in Knob Hill, Okay, in uh, what they call the Bermuda Triangle on Knob Hill, uh, where she has an IV or intravenous clinic. And she is working on with things, uh, different types of amino acids, a uh, thing they call uh, NAD, and I'd have to look up what the real name of it is in this because it's in this book. Uh, and uh, other things that she's created uh, cocktails for you to get intravenously. And so that's why her, her place is called the Vessel IV Bar. And the IV is in, in um, you know, the I and the V like Roman numerals. But uh, the, the thing is, is that this book and what she does medically and in medical uh, informatics, they, they dovetail, okay? So I learned about what she did by reading this book. I started talking to her and she was applauding me. Not that I need to shamelessly promote myself right now, but I am. She was applauding me for the fact I was reading this book and understanding what was going on. So this is one of the things I'm reading and I know it doesn't come up necessarily on screen the way it should, but it's, it's uh, called Su Successful Aging. And it's only, well, let's see. Uh, librarians always want to know this stuff. Okay, they want to know page numbers and junk like that. Just ask Sarah. She knows these things. This has 498 pages, Sarah. Okay. All right. So, you know, there you go. All right. How many? How many? 498. How small is the print? Oh, it's not too bad, really. I mean, you know, it, it, you know I'll take a look here. Uh, you know, it's not too bad. No, it's not bad. No, no, it's, it's probably about font 12. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, for, you know, for point 0.12, I'd say. So it's not too bad. Uh, hey, I've David, also, I have uh, another question. Uh, oh, I was going to tell you other things I've been reading, but I'll be quiet now. Oh, I was going to say, do you use the dust jacket as your bookmark or? I actually use a receipt. Okay. <laughs> and this re receipt actually had on it increased allostatic load Aliostasis, these are things in the in neuroscience, okay? And also about telomere length, which is the stuff I was talking about at the ends of, of um, chromosomes that allows them to re reposition and reproduce uh, different types of uh, cells, okay? All right, now, the other thing on the back of this, so you know that I'm really totally a, a nerd, okay? It says, happiness, dot, 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 not in another place, dot, 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 but this place, not for another hour, but this hour from Walt Whitman. Don't ask me why I have scientific stuff on the top. <laughs> and this is how bad I write. Here you go. You see and all the notes on that Walt thing. Walt Whitman on the back. Okay. But it does. All right. So that's what I use, Sarah. All right. All right. All right. So I'm, I'm a librarian. We're, we're industrious. We are, we, we are resourceful. We, we, we come into situations and we uh, try to understand what it is to, uh, uh, to, to use what you have. Okay, that's, that's what I would say. So there you are, it's approved. Okay, but you want any more books or is that a good enough one? No, uh, before I interrupted you, you were gonna say something, so. Well, I mean, I've, I've read uh, uh, some other fine books. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, oh, I've got one right over there. It'll take me 10 seconds. Let me do it. Okay, here I go. David Truer. David Truer writes about the, the uh, heartbeat of wounded knee. Okay. Okay. And this is a, a book from a Native American writer who uh, uh, talks about Native America from 1890 to the present, but does a great history previously, all the way back to uh, Columbus, and is just excellent. There's, there's no way I wouldn't suggest you pick up this book. Okay, this this is a book that's essential reading, 
and uh, I think he's an Ojibwa. Uh, in this book has 512 pages. <laughs> All right, so I've read that. It's a little light reading. A little re yeah. light reading. And, and I've read different novels from different people. Okay. When I go home and I read at night, I read a novel so I can go to bed. Uh, and so it has to be something fun, but it also has to be something that uh, is readable, has a plot line and all that stuff. And I like thrillers and I like like uh, whodunits and I, I like uh, different things. Uh, 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 there was an author who just died, uh, Grish, uh, what was his name? Uh, not Grisham, but maybe it was Grisham uh, that I was reading recently. I read Baldacci, I read... Um, other types of things, um, you name it, I read it. Uh, I just, I like uh, books that have technology in it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's just crazy. I, I read a bunch of stuff across the way uh, and it's fun. Yeah. That's all. Any, uh, any books in other languages? I can read in language? French okay. usually. I will read in German. Usually German, though, I'm dealing with theological works because, uh, to be quite honest, German and theology seem to go together. Anybody who has any theology degrees tends to have a German degree or a German uh, write-off that, they, that they've proved they can read German. Um, the, but French, uh, sometimes I read in Latin uh, just because there's a number of actually scientists in Latin in the earlier years. You know, you think about Galileo, I mean, he's writing in Latin sometimes because he's talking to church people who, unfortunately for poor Galileo, I think it was a good 400 years that he was on the bad list before he kind of got off of it. Um, uh, even here in the library, we have a copy from Isaac Newton that's in Latin. Uh, it's from the 1700s. Uh, and so it's very carefully in our archive, but if you ask Lucinda, she will bring it out and let you play with our toy. Okay, so we've got that. Um, but I've read that in the Latin trying to figure out things. And sometimes it's kind of funny as librarians, and I'm sure Sarah can talk about this too. Um, we get so many different references and, and uh, citations and things that you need to be pretty good at other languages to figure them out. And now, of course, with digital, you get all these translators out there. Uh, but uh, if you work with ancient languages like I did back in the 1980s, yes, I am that old, uh, I, um, I had to create my own fonts uh, to type things out uh, onto paper. And so I had a dot matrix printer and had to write my own encoding and encryption systems. Um, things have come a long ways. You still have that. Oh yeah, so yeah, I st yeah, so it's kind of funny. I mean, I look back and I said they didn't have anything back then. I mean, T is. I mean, I, I I have a friend who's a dinosaur. You know what I'm saying? So it's a uh, it's just the way it is. So go ahead, Katie. Sorry. Well, we're we're coming up on the hour here, so I had one more question for you, and that's uh, where you see the future of Skane Library OSL going. Well, I think the future is is great. I don't, you know, even though COVID-19 and the pandemic were awful for everybody and, you know, we talked to students and everyone and how to shift learning styles and, you know, presentation styles and, and all of that. Uh, the, reason, the reason the library, I think, has been a good leader and so is OSL is because uh, uh, for over 20 years, we have been in the digital world more than we've been in the physical world. Uh, we've had to uh, create uh, websites and search pro engines and be able to have data, you know, sites and, uh, you know, uh, data sets that would be able to be accessed. And uh, we've been doing that for a long time. And so when we had to go digital, the library really didn't miss a, uh, a beat when it came to being able to still be accessible. Our, our accessible material online and uh, uh, things like LibGuides, which Sarah, Sarah has been very big on, and I've been pushing her on it, and so I'm really thankful that she's done it. This is my shameless saying, please continue. Uh, the um, we've, we've created tools for people, even off-site, to, to be able to do things. Uh, we've, we've, we, uh, of course, have 
Uh, the ability, if you're a student or a faculty member, to, to hit the, the uh, online materials that we have uh, on site and off site. If you're off site, we have to have you go through what they call an easy proxy. But as soon as you're established, you can use all the materials we have here. And uh, we have, with ebooks and regular books and other things, over a million uh, sets of items that you can be drawing from. So, so as we go back to some physical things on campus, and uh, for example, the OSL area will become, I think, a hive of activity uh, because you'll have people online uh, checking in, but also you'll have people on site checking in. It's going to be kind of a, a fun little uh, pairing of both, I think. Uh, that, that will be a place where all of a sudden we're going to do more cooperative learning styles, and I'm hopeful to be able to do cooperative learning even with other universities in conversations, classes talking to classes and scholars talking to scholars. Um, I want to go to virtual reality and experimental reality types of areas. Uh, it costs money, but at that point, we're going to have to try to see if we can write some grants and, and do more of that. Um, I'm wanting to get that more involved at the library here. Um, I'm wanting us to uh, really be, again, known for being a destination on campus. Before COVID-19 hit, uh, that was the highest rating I think we got was that you went to the library because not only did you get stuff you needed and you had people who could help you, but it was fun. I mean, and, and we did fun things here. Um, uh, and, and maybe some people will look at me saying library fun, uh, but, but I tell you, we had fun. We, we had uh, lots of things. We even had a golf tournament in the library, okay? So you had putt-putt golf going on in the library on certain night, you know, on a night a year because we were trying to actually lead you through the library to what we had here. But I mean, this got to be cutthroat. Some of these people are really good with a, with a putt-putt, okay? Scared them. Uh, they were so good. Um, and, but uh, we did that. Uh, we have uh, engaged the world, which is gonna start up both, I think, online as well as in person. And this is something Sarah has, has been a part of before, but I want us to be able to have it a, a uh, taped or recorded uh, uh, engage the world where you have people from our community would come in and they would do about a half hour to a 40 minute presentation live with people we'd interact. And we also had lunch, okay? So this was a great thing to do. Uh, you, We had that, we have, uh, other different things, uh, Sarah had stuff that she would call, I think, uh, uh, tech, uh, tell me what was that, a library lab and tech tech lab and things like that, where she would try to give uh, special instruction at certain times during the day to people who could just walk up and ask questions. We, we really like to engage. I think the, the library that we're looking at will go into more presence with its physical engagement as well as continuous online and, uh, and I think that that will make this a really uh, inviting, engaging, and um, I think exciting place. Uh, it, we, we do this and uh, we like helping students. I used to be the one that used to read students' names, you know, when they went across the stage. And one of the things I really liked about that is that I saw so many people coming across graduating who'd been in the library and we knew them by face and name. And it was kind of fun to see them coming across. It was fun to see somebody who had been a freshman and maybe had been afraid to ask us for help because, it, you know, you got to get it out of your head uh, if you think that you have to be by yourself and learning. Learning is a community project. So they learned how to learn together. And, and when they were crossing the stage, in some ways, we were there with them crossing the stage because we helped them get there. And... There's not much more joy that you can get as an educator when you feel that feeling. So, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Anything else, Katie or Sarah? Sophie hasn't asked me one thing. Sophie. I mean, they've done, okay, actually, I do have one question and I'm sorry if you already addressed this, but where did you get all of those artifacts from? Uh, those are original from the country of origin. Those are from Israel. Those are from Diggs. Those are the real thing. And I had to sign statements to get them out um, because 
as a archaeologist, uh, you know, they basically have to to know what you are taking out of the country usually mm -hmm. and things like that. And you need to have done it ethically and all right. that type of stuff and have certificates that say I bought it maybe from an archaeologist uh, who is certified that this is allowed for sale, things like that. And um, uh, I always got upset with the people down in Caesarea Philippi. That's uh, uh, actually Caesarea Maritima, excuse me. Philippi was a fun place too, but uh, Maritima was right on the Mediterranean. It's where King Herod back uh, at the turn of the millennia, you know, from uh, BCE to CE, he, he had built this huge uh, port city because it, uh, he had to build it out because it was nothing but a sandy beach. Okay, so he had to literally dredge it out. This is 2000 years ago. They're dredging this place out, creating uh, this, this port, okay? And uh, the stuff down there is crazy because the Roman governors were living down there. So it's just an amazing place for what I would call Roman paraphernalia, as well as Byzantine, because it was still used in the Byzantine period for a while. And also then when the uh, Islamic conquest came through and the Crusaders, it's got all this stuff down there. Okay, I'm 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 buns, bumming around in bronze and iron age. Okay, these guys have got like so many ages that they. I mean, yeah, we want to go up and help them try to figure out what they got. Okay, but um, I was small potatoes and doing Jerusalem and the fortresses coming up to Jerusalem prior to you know like 700 uh, BCE. You know things like that. Uh, these guys these guys were doing all what I would call the the Hollywood stuff, you know, Romans, everybody likes the Romans, you know, everybody likes the Byzantines, you know, Crusaders, you know, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to identify people, you know, like, because they've been long gone. Okay. And, and so I'm, you know, mm, we're doing the hard work. These guys, uh, of course they know it's Crusaders, you know, I mean, gee, you know, there is a little bit of, uh, Pussing in the archaeologist world, have you haven't picked up on that? <laughs> I was a real archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my Sounds friends like were it. too, but all right, I just have to give them garbage. So, any last things, Katie? Oh, thank you. Just thank you so much for doing this, and uh, we look forward to another tech spotlight next week. We're going to have Teresa Kappel with the Office of Disability Services here at New Mexico Tech. That's really so, important stuff. Yeah, please tune yeah. in for that next yeah. week. Uh, one last thing, you, uh, you know, Katie is on the screen. Sarah, I wish you would put your face on the screen so people, well, yeah, they see your face, I guess. <laughs> Sophie, put your face up, will you? Just for a moment, if you can. Okay, uh, here's Sarah, here's Sophie. So both here's of you will have to say hello for the recording. Yeah, say hello now, say hello. Hello no. for the recording. <laughs> okay. Uh, these folks are, are uh, what I would call people with superpowers, okay, academically. And I really mean that. Um, you befriend these are the three people here. And you can befriend me too. I won't mind that. Okay? <laughs> but, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is when you succeed, we've done our job. Okay. So come see us because we're excited to help you. All right. That's why I wanted to get in, Katie. Take us off. Take us All off. Right. And All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for watching. <laughs> and uh, we have plenty of other video content up on our YouTube. So make sure to watch that and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, so I'll post that to various places. But thank you uh, for watching. And thank you, David, for being our guest this week. So happy to be. Come see me. Yep. Come All see right. us at the library. Okay. And the OSL. All right, have a good Great evening, job, everybody. Katie and David, thanks for putting this on. Okay. Thank you. See you guys. Bye.